and welcome to the Flourishing Center podcast. I'm Amelia Zivotovskaya, your host and founder of the Flourishing Center. We are training the change agents of the world and equipping them with research-based tools for healthy, happy, and successful living. And we're so grateful that you're here. Each episode features three sections. First is the Science Says section, where we summarize a recent research study and show you how to put the science into action. Next, we give you a research-based life hack with simple strategies for incorporating positive psychology into your life for greater well-being. And then our practitioner corner is where we interview someone who's out there living, breathing, and spreading positive psychology in their own unique way. Learn about how they're growing their personal and professional work and get inspired with strategies for how you might use positive psychology in your own life. Thanks for listening and let's dive in. Why, hello there. So great to be with you for another podcast episode. Today, I'm so excited to share with you the updated research on a very old question that happens in positive psychology. Does success lead to happiness or does happiness lead to success? In our life hack section, we'll explore a simple concept of how to move from needing to have more things in order to be happy and looking at how happiness can actually lead to those outcomes. And then for our practitioner corner, I can't wait for you to meet Eileen Schaefer. This amazing woman is helping people navigate the twists and turns of their lives as a transitions coach. In particular, she works with people in a very unique way. She walks with her clients as they do their session. You're going to learn so much from her as I did, and I can't wait to share all of this yummy research and application with you. So let's dive in. Today's Science Says is an article recently published in the Journal of Career Assessment titled, Does Happiness Promote Career Success? Revisiting the Evidence. This article is a follow-up to an article that was published over a decade ago that was asking the question, Does happiness lead to being successful, or is it that being successful leads to being happy? We know that happiness and success have been correlated for many, many years prior to that. But Dr. Sonia Lubomirsky and her colleagues have been following the research, and their initial hypothesis 10 years ago still holds true, that while we know that being successful can increase people's happiness level, Oftentimes, it's happiness that is leading to the success. The authors write, We conclude that the evidence continues to persuasively suggest that happiness is correlated with and often precedes career success, and that experimentally enhancing positive emotions leads to improved outcomes in the workplace. The researchers describe that in order to be able to prove that there's not just a relationship that's a correlation, but actually a causation, you need to run a variety of different studies on the topic. In particular, you want to explore cross-sectional studies, longitudinal studies, and experimental studies. The three types of studies put together enable us to get a broader picture of what's going on. First, we want to explore the fact that they describe happiness as a person who frequently experiences positive emotions, such as joy, happiness, and contentment, something that's frequently referred to as subjective well-being. And we know that frequency of positive emotions is actually a better predictor of well-being than the intensity of the emotion. I think that's important to highlight because sometimes people think that having intense levels of happiness is what we're looking for. But what the research suggests is just frequent experiences is what's most important. Let's explore the three types of research to give you an idea of what the studies were all about. When you do cross-sectional research studies, you look at asking the same question across a broad range of groups. When you do a longitudinal study, you're looking to follow people over a longer period of time. And this gives you a time direction or temporal order to things, meaning if you see that people's happiness level was high before they got the career change that they did, then you can conclude that it wasn't the career that enabled the happiness. The happiness came before the career. And then experimental studies are ones where we use a control group 
and you do one thing to one group and one to another. And in that study, you look to see what impact does positive emotion make on the person in terms of the experimental outcomes. I'll share with you the summary that the authors published. Through their cross-sectional literature, they found that there is in fact a link between happiness and many different success-related outcomes. They've shown that happiness is associated with job autonomy, job satisfaction, job performance, pro-social behavior, meaning behavior that helps people and connects people, social support, popularity, and income. They also report that happy people receive more positive peer and supervisor evaluations and are less likely to withdraw from work by becoming habitually absent or burning out. Likewise, the longitudinal research suggests that people who are happy at an initial time point are more likely to find employment, be satisfied with their jobs, acquire higher status, perform well, be productive, receive social support, be evaluated positively, engage in fewer withdrawal behaviors, and obtain higher income at a subsequent time point. And lastly, this summarized the experimental research, which has demonstrated that when people are randomly assigned to experience positive emotions, they negotiate more collaboratively, they set higher goals for themselves, they persist at difficult tasks longer, evaluate themselves and others more favorably, help others more, and demonstrate greater creativity and curiosity than people who are assigned to experience neutral or negative emotions. All this comes together to remind us that the argument still holds true, that it's not success that leads to happiness, it's actually that happiness may be what is leading to success, and that while the two are highly correlated, that we can explore how to build our happiness as a pathway to building our workplace success. Up next is our life hack section, where I'm gonna give you a simple strategy for remembering that it's not success that leads to happiness. Happiness can lead to success. Today's life hack explores a simple paradigm that is timeless. The question of have, do, be versus be, do, have. Many people think that in order to be happy, they first have to have certain things in their life, like I need to have a steady job or I need to have a lot of money so I can do the things that I want to do so that I can be happy. Or I need to have a partner in my life so I can do the types of things I want to do in relationship so I will be happy as opposed to focusing on being happy. And when we're in a positive emotional space, we can do the things that we want to do, which in turn will lead us to have the type of things that we want to have. And the article that we just previously mentioned in our science as section seems to support just that. That people who first experience positive emotions tend to do different things. They tend to negotiate better. They tend to be better evaluated by their peers, by their supervisors. They tend to persist more towards their goals. Happier people tend to do better. And they tend to do better in every area of their life, according to research. Then it is the doing of those different things that enables us to have more of the success, connection, impact that we want to have in the world. So I invite you to ask yourself, in what area of your life have you been finding yourself saying that you need to have or do certain things in order to be happy? I need to have the body that I want in order to be able to move my body more, be more active in order to be healthy or happier. But perhaps finding ways to be happy in this moment and explore feeling healthier and then doing things that would support you then having the body that you want. So there are lots and lots of examples where we can take the have, do, be and flip it easily to be, do, have. And there you have a recipe for true success. 
Hello everyone. With me today, I've got a special guest. Eileen Schaefer is a life transition specialist and positive psychology practitioner. She helps people navigate the twists and turns of their life. She's joining us today from San Diego. She lives right by the beach. And something you might not know about her is that it's her birthday on Friday. And in addition to this special day of her birthday, and of course, it's also Groundhog Day, right, Eileen? Yep, you got it. It is. She has some beautiful rituals around how she spends her birthday. So we're going to get to learn about Eileen, learn about her work. But I actually first want to learn about this special thing that you do on your birthday every year. Tell us about it. Oh, sure. So, I gosh, it's probably been years that I've done this. And I actually, my dad used to do it, too. So I have to give him a little bit of credit. Um, But I spend the day alone. And I... I kind of just saturate myself in the day because I always think of birthdays are the day that it's our first day. You know, we think of New Year's as being the first day of the year and that's when everything restarts. But in my mind, it's the day we came into the world. And so that's my, that's my new year. And so I don't like to just run through life on, on my birthday because then I kind of miss um, just relishing in the day. So I spend the day alone and, um, I, ref- I spend time reflecting on just all the goodness that has come through the year and then assessing where I am currently and then identifying what I want to bring into my life. So it kind of just gives me a full 360 view of, of my life. And it's funny because I always have friends saying, you can't be alone on your birthday. We have to take you out. And I always love going out with friends, but just not during that day. So I've scheduled those other times. And then Um, after I spend the day alone, then that's when we have family time. So everyone, the kids come home from school, my husband's back from work, and that night we go out and um, have family time. So it's, it's just the, uh, it's my favorite day. I love it. I love that, Eileen, for so many reasons. Uh, Probably one of the main reasons is because I think rituals are such an important part of well-being, and it's one of the things that our culture has lost some of. So bringing rituals into our lives to help us be happier and healthier is just such a powerful thing to do. And I celebrate this one and happy early birthday. Thank you. I, I couldn't agree more with you about rituals. I feel like that's a time that you get to just hit pause and just be in the moment. And that's, that's what I think birthdays do. And it allows you to celebrate yourself. And then when you get to celebrate other people, it allows you to focus in on them too. So it's a, they're a neat time of year. They are. And Eileen, tell us, what does it mean to be a life and transition specialist? And what do you offer to people when they are going through these twists and turns of their life? How did you come to do what you're doing today? Well, I was watching friends and family um, members go through the huge transition of parenthood and um, working, demanding jobs, having, um, you know, great education and really feeling great in their professional space, and then all of a sudden um, becoming a parent and just that shift and whether or not they wanted to be um, full-time taking care of their kids, which I say working for love because I think you're working regardless of whether you're getting paid or not. And so they do the shift of working with their, with their kids at home or they're continuing to um, be employed by somebody else outside But regardless of what they're doing, I'm noticing this shift in identity, this shift in who I am, and how do you manage this really enormous and sometimes overwhelming transition in life? And there wasn't a tremendous amount of support for these women going through this. And so that's what inspired me to go back and get my master's in life transitions counseling. And I worked within that space for years privately in a private practice. And this is before I was married, before I had kids or anything. So it was just something that really spoke to me and um, connected to me. Then I did end up getting married and having kids and obviously going through my own life transitions and continued working in that capacity. And then it's, it's expanded from there in really beautiful ways. Um, just as the, those same clients, their lives have changed. Same. So has my practice. And so I continue to work with that clientele. And then I also work with um, women who have been home for quite some time raising their children and starting to think, okay, now what? Where's that identity piece? And how do I continue to grow as an individual and foster myself when I put so much into nurturing and nourishing 
the, all the humans around me and the family around me. Um, so it's gone into that. And then um, as those people are in now in their, um, some, many of them back into the professional world, my work has moved a lot into executive coaching and working with people who are working, but looking at the whole picture of work life. And I call it fulfillment. I don't love the word balance unless, of course, I know you, you do. Um, I think you do yoga, but I like balance for yoga, Pilates, et cetera. But work-life balance, I think, sets us up for um, disappointment often. And so I'd rather our lives don't necessarily look balanced but hopefully they look fulfilled. And so that's what I work with clients on quite a bit is that fulfillment picture. So sometimes life might be more demanding than work, vice versa. Sometimes it's hitting at the same time and really looking at how do you still remain fulfilled and nourish yourself when life is pulling you at all angles. I love that, Eileen, so much because I, I do think that we get into trouble when we hear work-life balance because balance tells people that perhaps there's this point that you can get to, which is quote unquote, a balanced point. And it's not ever a balanced point. And this is where I think that people are, especially in the field of wellness, for example, I, shifting the focus away from wellness to well-being because ness is a state. So people, when they think of, oh, you know, I'm working on my wellness or, or I'm trying to become more well, it's thinking that they'll get to a state of wellness where they're done and their work is done, as opposed to looking at well-being, which is a state of being, which is always in flux and it's always moving and it's dynamic. And so I totally agree with oh, you, love that. right? That when we like just shift the way that we think about it, because if I'm thinking about wellness, it's like, okay, am I there yet? Do I, am, am I as active as I want to be? Am I eating right the way that I want to be? And it's like, well, yeah, I, I can sustain that for a couple of days, but then my life changes a little bit or a couple of weeks and my life changes a little bit. And when I used to think of it as wellness, it was like either I was there or I wasn't. But when I started to look at it from the lens of well-being, it's like I'm always focusing on my well-being, which is a dynamic, ever-changing dance that I have to feel my way through. And work life is never going to be perfectly balanced and still and at a fixed point. It is just always dancing and ebbing and flowing. And so I always ask people, you know, are they happy with their dance? Are they dancing well? Love that. And it's kind of that ing. I love the whether it's well-being or fulfilling, you know, I love, that's great. I love what you just said. Ooh, I like that too. I feel like there's something brewing here, like a theory of the ing the theory. Exactly. <laughs> the ing theory. We'll have to, we'll have to brew on that a little bit. And Eileen, I'm curious where positive psychology then fit into the picture for you. Yeah. So when I um, selected the program, the life transitions program that I took, it was really conscious. It was a program working with people who are fundamentally healthy and managing a shift in life. And so it was very solution focused. And while positive psychology really hadn't expanded to the extent that it is, the research was certainly in its infancy. We read many articles by Martin Seligman and others. It, it wasn't its own entity at that time, but I certainly gravitated towards that. And much of our learning, it's funny, we recently moved about a year and a half ago. So I've, of course, been going through boxes that I've slept with me throughout wherever we've lived that my husband finally said, open this box and get, you know, if you want it, great, but if not, get rid of it already. And so I was looking through actually old graduate school um, boxes of stuff, for lack of a better word, and so much of it is just consistent with the learnings of positive psychology. And so while positive psychology seems newer to me because I took the certification and um, graduated from your program, it really, that learning was embedded, much of it was embedded in the life transitions counseling program that I took. However, what's so exciting is all the research has come through in the years since I graduated graduate school. So it's super exciting for me to see things that we thought we knew and things that we thought would be good for people actually being science-based now. And so I feel like it was just a, um, just a nice flow and continuation of what I had learned um, in school so many years ago. And so I absolutely love the positive psychology certification program because it really solidified my knowledge. And I actually I hate saying solidified because it's an evolving knowledge base. Um, so it's continued, expanded um, my knowledge base into 
um, kind of, again, learning the science and moving it forward. That's beautiful, Eileen. And tell us more about what do you do with people when you work with them as their life and transitions coach or counselor? Sure. And it's funny, I do, I, my clients often call me coach and it is, it's a hybrid of the two, I would say that I, that I do, I kind of ebb and flow between those states um, with clients. One unique thing that I do just is um, first and foremost is how I work with clients and that's, I walk with them. And so I walk, even if I'm with a client who is virtual, my clients and I each put on our headsets and we start walking and I've done this since the beginning of my practice years ago. And what I find is it helps to really not only move people physically, but also emotionally. So Eileen, I just want to clarify, you physically walk, like you go for a walk and they go for a walk? You got it. (laughs) We both are walking. And so my office, and I, now I feel really bad because my office now is on the beach as I walk. And many of my clients um, are East coast or in the state of Washington. So they're right now, their walk is not as comfortable. I don't think as my walk is. Um, And sometimes they're not actually able to walk with me because Um, weather prohibits it. However, yes, so I, and then my clients here, we walk in person, obviously. Um, And that it's a wonderful way to work with someone um, on so many levels. So there is the obvious, the physical benefits. And I feel like I'm very committed to um, the, the thought that our physical well-being contributes to our mental well-being. And I know with you, you've added that into the PERMA construct um, of positive psychology with vitality. And I couldn't agree more with you. And so what I find is if someone is going to spend an hour with me working together, chances are it might be hard to find another hour to work out, particularly for my clients who have full-time jobs, full-time families, et cetera. So this way I know, okay, good. They've at least walked for an hour. And even if they can't do anything else, that's a great, that's a great way to get their movement. And so it's from those two standpoints, the physical and emotional, it's fantastic It also, the research is coming out more and more about how walking opens pathways to greater creativity, clarity, enhanced problem solving, all things that we want with our clients. We want them to have access to that, to that creative side of their brain and um, to be able to start thinking about, okay, if I have this issue, how do I problem solve it? And the walking helps to facilitate that. And the other piece of walking that I love, and I have some clients who need to be, again, weather permitting, need, they have to, or not what, when weather doesn't permit, they end up in, say, a mall and walking the mall. So this gives a little bit different of an essence than if you're walking outside. However, the changing environment also helps to um, create that movement. And so it's not a stagnant environment um, where they're sitting with four walls around them just the view around can help to trigger ideas and thoughts and and clues when they're feeling confused. So there's a bunch of benefits. And then the final one, which I really particularly like specifically with new clients is that walking side by side creates a really comfortable dynamic. And when you have a new client, their anxiety can be elevated. Cortisol levels are, you know, higher. And um, when they come into the office and they think, okay, I'm going to know, you know, what, what the solution is for you, or they feel uncomfortable sharing something, the walk helps to really ease, ease that stress level and um, allows them to come to a sense of calm, which again is what I want for us to be able to do our best work together. I'm so inspired by that, Eileen, because when I uh, first started off early on in my coaching practice, I actually used to offer that as well. I used to offer walk and talk sessions, and I actually used to offer a discounted rate to my clients for the walk and talk because I was like, well, I'm going to get the benefit of of walking as well. And um, and I live in New York City, not far from Central Park, um, so a block away from Central Park. So it was something I was really, really excited about and committed to doing. And then I did a few of them and my schedule just kind of changed. And so you're so inspiring me to reconsider 
that element of things. And I know that sometimes I used to get questions like people would say things like, well, is, is it distracting or how do they take notes and do they, do they, um, uh, do you record the sessions for them? What are some of the logistical elements that enable you to do this type of work so efficiently with people? Sure. And that is definitely a question that comes up with clients is, okay, what does that look like? How does it, how does it work? I prefer that clients don't take notes um, while we're walking. And if, if they felt like, ah, oh, I need to, absolutely. Because again, I want the client's to be doing what they would like to do. However, the reason I'd rather not is it keeps the client very, very present. And when we stop to take notes, all of a sudden it just kind of stops the process. And so what we do is, and usually clients are just fine. They, it's funny, the first meeting, they usually do have a piece of paper and pencil with them just in case. And they, they don't end up um, using it. I don't, I, gosh, I can't remember someone actually using it. However, once we're walking, we get really immersed in the, the act of just being together and, um, and, and the story, the client's story, where they are. And at the end of every meeting, then what I do is ask them, what are the key things, usually three things that they feel that they want to commit to working on. I always like to end my sessions with action items. And when I first started doing this, we would meet and then I would send them the action items. However, what I realized, those are the action items that resonate with me. And that's not what I want. I want the clients to obviously really um, have what bubbles up for them to be what they what they. Um, work deeper on. So, so now what we'll do is we finish our walk and then we'll talk at the very end and kind of they'll repeat back what really connected and resonated with them. And then we'll say, you know, okay, is this something that you want to take further or um, is there something else? And they really decide what they want to work on. And then I'll have them send to me can you, um, or I'll just ask them, can you please send me over the key things that you're going to work on so that I know what you're focused on so that we can then launch from that our next meeting. So that's kind of the logistics of it. I do the other piece of the logistics when we're, when I'm in person with someone, I also do always choose routes. I have um, in San Diego. Now I have two beaches that I walk on when we were in Washington. I had um, one park that, um, that I used to always walk on. I like to pick routes that have water um, and the water offers that, um, that being in nature, the sense of awe that we talk about in positive psychology and um, just the therapeutic benefits of being by water. So those are the, that's the other thing about kind of location. Thank you so much again. I'm so inspired because actually I, I, my previous office was one block from Central Park and now I've moved a couple of blocks over beautifully sandwiched now by the other park where we're along the West side highway in New York city and we're by the water. And I'm, I think you're going to pull me out of my, pull me out of my space and get me back to walking with my clients too. I'm so inspired. And I love that your motto is step into your life. And the process of helping people through their transitions again is such a, such a gift because I, I at least found with my coaching clients that oftentimes when people are struggling with their life, especially during those transition points, they're so critical of themselves. Like there's this element where we're like, well, I should be able to just have this together. And it's like, well, your life just got turned around. You relocated, you moved to a new city, you had to get a new apartment and you had to figure out your new grocery stores and your new habits and routines while being in a new office and trying to create a new normal for yourself. And it's, I'm sure you see this too, that people come in from this place of self-criticism because we don't have it just woven in to our life to have these, these rituals around transitions. Whereas just a few thousand years ago, we had, you know, this is your transition into womanhood, your transition into manhood, your transition into uh, you know, the, your, your head of your tribe, or you're now learning to do this, or you finally have mastered that. And, and, and I think that there was just more understanding that these are important stepping stones in our life and that perhaps they could help people treat themselves with greater compassion rather than I think where we go to, which is criticism. It, 
you are so right. I was actually just meeting with a client the other day and super accomplished woman who's just done a phenomenal job. And she's now taken on something else that's huge. And, and she was saying, oh my gosh, I, you know, it, I feel so frustrated because I'm not, you know, um, there are things that I'm doing that I wish that I wasn't doing. And I said, you know, let's pause right there and thank you and thank yourself for everything that you've done to get yourself to where you are. And I said, and now maybe look at that as a jacket that was really in style then. And now that jacket's out of style. It served its purpose. It was great at the time. Now let's get rid of that jacket and, and now assess you're here now. What do you need moving forward? What kind of style do you want to put on? And because she has worked so hard and really what, what worked in the, the past was exactly what got her to where she is today. And I think that's what people forget. Even like the relocation one, I have several clients who have either A, relocated or B, are planning to relocate um, very soon. And that's something I think people forget is you get used to where you are and then you do. They don't realize how difficult it is to relocate rebuild a community, like you said, figure out where the grocery store is, figure out where your favorite coffee place is going to be, not to mention meet some friends along the way and start a new job and, you know, raise your family or whatever it is. There's so many elements. And so being able to take a breath and say, you know, gosh, thank you for getting me to where I am. And now what do, do I need moving forward? And that patience piece. I really appreciate that, Aileen. It reminds me of one of my favorite quotes by Marshall Goldsmith. It's one of the titles of his books, What Got You Here Won't Get You There. And as you pointed out, that without without that outside support, sometimes we just keep operating from this place. Well, this is what got me here. Of course, it's going to get me there without the opportunity to maybe pause and, and notice. Absolutely. I'm I'm also curious about some of the other things that you do. So you work with people individually as a coach. You also are a speaker and you are creative because you've built this beautiful product called Mindful Stepping. Can you tell us more about that? Oh, sure. So Mindful Stepping actually is a, um, it came out of my positive psychology certification program from the Flourishing Center. And it's funny when um, Karen was my instructor and when she, at the very beginning, she told us, you know, you're going to have a final project, but it can be anything that you want just so that you take the material that you've learned over this time and make it feel meaningful and purposeful to you, whatever that looks like. So, of course, I was trying to figure out what's that going to look like for me? You know, you think about it as the weeks progress. And I'm thinking, hmm, and I knew it had to have something to do with walking. And um, just because that, like I said, that's the essence of um, how I do my work. What I decided to do is to essentially take the learnings of positive psychology, everything that I learned during the certification program, and put it in a really user-friendly way so that people who either A, cannot work with somebody individually or maybe they are working with someone individually, but they want to have kind of that added boost when they just need kind of a shift in attitude, which I know we all can use sometimes, or a boost in confidence, whatever it is. I thought it'd be great for them to be able to pull a card out of a deck and have positive psychology inspired activities guide them while they're walking. And so I created the deck as, a, like I said, a culmination of the positive psychology program. And it, I blended it with the work that I do and some of the questioning that I will ask my clients and then things that just kind of came to me that I thought this could be a great thing for someone to do while walking. Um, and the exciting thing is I keep hearing back from people and they're being used in so many different ways, which is fun. Um, people will say, I went out with my partner and we did the cards together or I use them with my child. Um, I have several people who have bought um, decks to give out at work and then they'll use them in their kind of corporate retreat space. And then um, another classmate of mine from the positive psychology program, she has, she leads as her final project, she does positive psychology retreats for coaches. And so she buys decks by the dozens for her retreats for these um, these coaches that are in her training program. So it's and then on top of that, they've been sold at um, three different stores, which is fun. So now I'm in a um, a transition period with them, 
because they've sold, all of them have sold out at this point. And um, so they are back ordered. And I'm looking at possibly either reprinting again on my own or possibly going with a publisher to print them. So that's kind of exciting. Wow. Congratulations, Eileen. It's such an exciting thing to see your cap final project Thank you. now morph and be in transition into a product that is being sold in stores, that is being used in all these different ways. And we're so excited for you. And again, best of luck. And I want to tell our listeners that you can get your own set of mindful stepping cards on Eileen's website, EileenSchaefer.com. We'll tell you more about that at the end, but I have a deck myself and it's such a beautiful and handy tool. So congratulations for creating it, Eileen. Thank you. I'm curious if you can tell us more about your self-care practices. We ask all of our positive psychology practitioners about this because our motto is self-care is health care. And I hear that you walk and I hear that you have this birthday ritual. What other self-care practices nourish and nurture you? Sure. Let's see. I, I always start my morning with a cup of tea. So I love, I'm a big tea drinker. So that always kind of gets me started in a peaceful way. And I exercise is, is really important for me. So the walking, like you said, um, and then I also take a few different classes at the gym and just moving my body does, it, it gets me out of my head, which is a good thing. Um, so, so that's huge for me. Spending time alone, I make sure that I do have alone time. And then being with family, really replenishes me as well as being with friends community we've like I said we've moved a handful of times in the last um, handful of years and having that community to ground me is what definitely fuels my soul as well that's beautiful Eileen thank you so much Eileen how can people learn more about you and your work they can go to my website which is um eileenshafer.com so it's i-l-e-n-e S-C-H-A-F-F-E-R.com. And then the deck has its own website, but you also can access it from the Eileen Schaefer website. But the deck is takeyourthoughtsforawalk.com. And please, even though, like I said, they are sold out, I do have a wait list on there. So anyone who is interested, please do sign up on the wait list. And as soon as I know the direction that I'm going to go, they'll be made available and I'll let you know. Beautiful. Eileen, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today and sharing your wisdom. And I'm definitely going to take our thoughts and our conversation for a walk. And it's been great to have you here with us. Amelia, thank you so much for having me. As as I've told you many times, you are an absolute inspiration and such a gift to the world of positive psychology. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this podcast. It is such a joy and such an honor to be able to share this work with you and in particular to share with you what our positive psychology practitioners are up to. If you're interested in becoming a positive psychology practitioner, check out our website and our upcoming trainings. We have a few that start in the next couple of weeks. And if you're already one of our certified applied positive psychology practitioners, check out our advanced programming just for capsters. We've got our coaching certification program, our resilience trainer program, and our flourishing skill group training program, all of which are available to you as positive psychology graduates of ours. Thank you so much for listening. If there's anything we can do to help you have a greater sense of flourishing in your life, please reach out. We'd love to create a podcast for you about it. Thank you for listening, and I wish you an incredible rest of your day. So that's huge for me. Spending time alone, I make sure that I do have alone time. And then being with family really replenishes me as well as being with friends. Community, we've, like I said, we've moved a handful of times in the last um, handful of years. And having that community to ground me is what definitely fuels my soul as well. That's beautiful, Eileen. Thank you so much. Eileen, how can people learn more about you and your work? They can go to my website, which is um, EileenSchaefer.com. So it's I-L-E-N-E-S-C-H-A-F-F-E-R.com. And then the deck has its own website, but you also can access it from the Eileen Schaefer website. But the deck is TakeYourThoughtsForAWalk.com.
www.thepeachcoffee.com. And please, even though, like I said, they are sold out, I do have a wait list on there. So anyone who is interested, please do sign up on the wait list. And as soon as I know the direction that I'm going to go, they'll be made available and I'll let you know. Beautiful. Eileen, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today and sharing your wisdom. And I'm definitely going to take our thoughts and our conversation for a walk. And it's been great to have you here with us. Amelia, thank you so much for having me. As as I've told you many times, you are an absolute inspiration and such a gift to the world of positive psychology. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this podcast. It is such a joy and such an honor to be able to share this work with you and in particular to share with you what our positive psychology practitioners are up to. If you're interested in becoming a positive psychology practitioner, check out our website and our upcoming trainings. We have a few that start in the next couple of weeks. And if you're already one of our certified applied positive psychology practitioners, check out our advanced programming just for capsters. We've got our coaching certification program, our resilience trainer program, and our flourishing skill group training program, all of which are available to you as positive psychology graduates of ours. Thank you so much for listening. If there's anything we can do to help you have a greater sense of flourishing in your life, please reach out. We'd love to create a podcast for you about it. Thank you for listening, and I wish you an incredible rest of your day. to create a podcast for you about it. Thank you for listening and I wish you an incredible rest of your day.